Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to New Week and to our study uh, of understanding the lines. And we're still going through and drawing the lines for uh, the book of Judges, uh, specifically here now we're dealing with Abimelech. And we had been looking at this this last week. <clears throat> And uh, we were reading Signs of the Times, August 4th, 1881, and we're going to begin there. So I need to share that screen. And um, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear, dear Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for your goodness and love. We are thankful for this new week and for the blessings um, of the past week for the trials that we have experienced and for you teaching us to depend upon you in all things, whether good or bad, that we can receive the trials and the blessings from your hand. Uh, we pray, Lord, that um, you can be in this study this morning through thy spirit, that you can speak to our hearts, that our hearts and our minds will be open and clear and that you will correct any errors we may have in our understanding. Help us to be instructed by you. We pray for this movement. We know that this world around us is in utter confusion, but we ask, Lord, that we can be a clear, shining light to those in darkness. Be with us now, we pray and ask. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> So, um, so Dwight, if you remember, we were going through this on Thursday, and we had read um, paragraph 10, I think was the last thing that we had read. We might have touched a little bit on paragraph 11 here, so signs of the times. But... Let's, let's recap paragraph 10 and then go into 11. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what we're looking at specifically is how this article relates to what we're going through right now. Yeah, and, and we were dealing with it also just from the point of the United States as well, um, but also in, within the movement. So we are seeing both an external and an internal application that we didn't really worded it that way. Right, and the way, the way that we were approaching this on Thursday, We'd gotten into a conversation regarding this on the on the current resident of the White House. Mm -hmm. And we were addressing the fact that there had been an article that was written where the current vice president, his current ticket mate that ran with him in 2020 could be removed from office. Now, this would be the third such removal in American history. Mm -hmm. First, it occurred when, uh, I believe it was John Calhoun was removed in 1832. The second was Sparrow Agnew, who was convicted of tax evasion. Yeah, and Spiro Agnew, I always thought he looked like a mafia guy, but I guess he's just Greek, that's why. Well, <laughs> I mean... Okay, so he's Greek. Yes. Greek father, American mother. Yeah. That's just when I was younger, when I was a, a kid, um, you know, and I'd see Spiro Agnew. That's what I always thought of him as. It was like a mafia boss or something. Okay. But, but, <laughs> okay. But oh, a, of course, there's another another connection here because his, his full name is Spiro Theodore Agnew. Oh, so, <clears throat> <laughs> so but if i'm not mistaken and i i'm more than willing to be corrected i believe the current vice president is the 49th vice president so elected within the country okay yeah so we've had vice presidents that weren't elected right now now, um, just then that means that um, uh, Biden, when he was vice president, he would have been the the, the 47th then vice president. 
when he was elected as vice president. I believe that to be correct. So now there was there's another article that I'm going to I'm going to send up that we may be able to discuss tomorrow but at this point we have a situation within the country because when the new Congress takes office, and I believe they will take office on January 2nd, since January 1st this year is going to be a Sunday. Okay. When the new Congress takes takes office, the new Speaker of the House will then be third in line for the presidency, should anything happen to the current occupant of the White House or to his current or then vice president. Mm-hmm. Now, that would be an interesting situation because if anything were to happen and a new speaker were to be then president, mm-hmm. we would go from having a very liberal elected president to having a potentially conservative unelected president. Okay. So I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, How do they elect the Speaker of the House? The Speaker of the House is elected by the incoming House members in the caucus of the party that has the control of the House of Representatives. So, so they just, so the Republicans have the control of the House right now. So they would just have, all of them would get together and decide who the Speaker of the House is going to be. Correct. And there would be, there would be several that would then become part of the leadership of the House because there's a, a, a defined pecking order based on seniority. No. So is the House usually the oldest then? It's generally, it it can be of the oldest elected member or the longest serving members. Okay. So you could have a member say that has been in the House for 20 years and only be 45 years old, you could have another member that is, say, 70 years old, but only been in the House for 10 years. And the ones that served, have served the longest would be the ones seen as being greatest in seniority. And so, so in, uh, for the Speaker of the House, then, that it often has to do with seniority, um, I mean, that's why they put yes the as the leader of as the speaker of the house, and now, and you couldn't just put Trump as uh, the speaker of the house if you wanted to. No, which of course they wouldn't want to, but uh, they couldn't do that. Now, also, then when let's say um, uh, the Republicans, uh, um, you know, they they put you know that well they have the the majority in 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 the house and so they'll have the speaker of the house now you're saying that that speaker of the house is the third in line so if biden and uh, kamala harris they happen to die suddenly um then that would put the speaker of the house as the president correct and and that that president um would have to serve as president they couldn't turn down the opportunity or could they It is, can, it is possible that they could turn it down, but more likely that they would not. Yeah. And then if they were president, um, they, they could pick a vice president. Correct. So, so the Speaker of the House, whoever that might be, could make Trump the vice president, and then they could die, and then Trump could become president. I'm just trying to figure out what scenarios people might come up with. Right. No, that, that's a possibility. Yeah. But in, in these kind of situations, um, 
the the Constitution has been fairly clear. Yes, they could pick a a vice president from outside of Congress. Now, if we when we look at these situations historically, when a vice president was removed, such as John Calhoun, or when a vice president died during mm. a, a term, at some times the presidents would not have a vice president. They would just be somebody, different people who might serve a role at times. Correct. I mean, brother, brother yes. um, Dwight, um, yeah. I'm going to, could there, could, is there been any way in history where they have a, um, the Congress have elected somebody outside the Congress to be um, House of Speaker? No. It hasn't? No. Oh, okay. Well, then, that's, that's, the reason I'm saying that because that was part of um, Collins' prediction. Right. Was right. That they, they was going to, they was going to, um, they was going to be all the Republicans were going to get the house and then they was going to um, vote Trump into the speakership. Into the speakership. Yeah. And then, and then uh, impeach the president and vice president. Yeah. That's not going to happen. But no. yeah, I know it's not going to happen, but I'm just saying that, that he, he said it was, uh, I can't remember who said it, but it was point in history where, where they did the same thing. They voted somebody that was outside the house into that position. I remember them t telling us, saying something about that. I mean, maybe in, in in the really early history, maybe there was unclear precedence of what they were supposed to do, but I, I haven't been able to find it. I know there was this claim. I don't know what they were okay. referring to. I didn't think it was going to happen either, but I'm just saying it. I'm just saying that that's that's that was part of the addiction that they. Yeah, yeah. He originally he was originally saying that, and uh, I didn't notice any of that in his last presentation. No, I mean but, I went over. I spent hours on it. Yeah, but part of the thing about about this is that conservatives, uh, Republicans, are not stupid. I mean, to think so short-sightedly as we need to get Trump in to be president in 2022 rather than waiting till 2024, it just would be illogical. And Democrats can think like that short term, uh, but Republicans can't, you know, by the very nature of why they're Republicans, not Democrats. Well, <clears throat> the Constitution is silent on the the situation as to who can be the house speaker because the way that it is written it says that the house of representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers now nowhere does it say that it has to be from within the house or from outside of the house but the historical point has been that the speaker has been chosen from the caucuses of the party then in power mm -hmm. to determine who the House Speaker is going to be. Now, this last came up with when, when they were looking to who was going to succeed John Boehner as the Speaker of the House when he, a Republican, had been Speaker and was looking to step down. Now, <clears throat> The situation regarding a demise of, of someone such as the current occupant of the White House is possible. Now, let's say that, that the decision was made to remove Ms. Harris from her position. And in the intervening times that the current occupant of the White House was to pass away. 
-hmm. then the House Speaker would be elevated to become the president. Is it possible for a new president to choose someone from outside of Congress to become their vice president? The answer there is yes. When Richard Nixon accepted the resignation of Spiro Agnew, he then had to choose a new vice president because he was under fire of Watergate and he did not wish to have the Speaker of the House at that time elevated to the presidency. So he chose Gerald Ford, who had been a member of Congress and was seen as being a very safe choice. Gerald Ford was elevated to the presidency when Nixon resigned in 1974. Now, Ford chose Nelson Rockefeller as his vice president. And Rockefeller had been governor of New York and was not a member of Congress at that time. So he reached outside of Congress for his selection of vice president. It's the only time in American history that that has occurred, but there is a precedent that has now been set. Mm -hmm. So could a speaker be elevated to the presidency? Yes. Could that speaker then choose someone outside of the existing Congress to become their vice president? Yes. But that choice has to undergo examination within the sitting Congress, which is both the House and the Senate. Okay. And so you have, um, well, right now you have the Democrats technically uh, in control of the Senate and the Republicans in control of the House. Correct. And that's because there's two independents that actually side with the Democrats in the Senate. Right. No. You know, I don't know who they are, and I don't really understand that situation, but I guess they're independent, but they're really still Democrats in some way? No. Well, they're not Democrats, but they side with the Democrats. Okay. One of them is Bernie Sanders. Okay. So he's going to side with the Democrats in anything against Republicans. <laughs> right. Now, the, the current situation with Bernie Sanders, of course, he is not really a democrat he is a socialist yeah comrade sanders that's what they call him of course yeah. who's the other one i'm looking so angus king of maine yeah. well, why is he an independent because he chose not to run as either a republican or a democrat Okay, and then they still elected him. Okay. Yeah, he was he assumed office January third of two thousand thirteen, and his current term will end in two thousand twenty five. Okay. He was governor of Maine from nineteen ninety five to two thousand three. So. Uh, King is more <clears throat> of a moderate left than center of the Democrats. So he is not a consistent liberal vote. Okay. But yeah, as far as the idea that you could get somehow um, Trump as vice president, approved as vice president even would be extremely unlikely. It, it would be difficult. I mean, the, the only way that this could occur would be if the Republicans were to vote as a solid block, if the Georgia runoff 
resulted in the defeat of the current liberal senator. And if then Angus King, as a independent, were to vote for the approval of Mr. Trump. Yeah, so that would be pretty unlikely. It'd be it'd be something to be to be watched if that was to occur. Yeah. Now we're we're in a situation right now. It's interesting to me because we have we have spoken quite a bit about Trump and what's been going on, but we've been ignoring several other points. Mm -hmm. One point currently is that the majority of the members of the Supreme Court are Roman Catholic. Okay. When you've got six sitting members of the Supreme Court that are Catholic, of a nine-member panel, you have a division of the government that may well be under the control of the Pope. Yeah. Now, the replacement of Nancy Pelosi as Speaker does remove her. And quite honestly, she has been very vocal and very public about her Catholic faith. When the Bishop of San Francisco basically said to her, you will not receive communion within San Francisco, what did she do? She went to Rome to receive communion and received it. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I know about that. Now, that speaks volumes. It does. It speaks huge volumes. We have many members within Congress and with, well, within the House and within the Senate that are Catholic. It is something for us to watch because. What if the takeover of the government has already occurred? I mean, in this last election cycle, quite a bit was being said about how democracy was at risk. Well, honestly, America was never founded as a democracy. America was never founded considered a democracy it's always been considered a republic correct now what is the what what are what is a majority difference a major difference between a republic and a democracy constitution well the rule of a Republic is by law. The rule of a democracy is that whatever the majority says goes. They don't care so much about the law. Yeah. This uh, is now, um, just a point on this. Go ahead. So I was reading uh, a book by uh, Thomas Sowell, which I've not done the book yet, but it's... Um, it's called Conflict of Visions. Okay. And what he's addressing here is basically two different ways of looking at the world that, you know, it's not always consistent. People aren't always consistent in how they look at it, but uh, it's a useful analytical uh, tool that he, he gives. And, um, but the idea of the rule of law is what they call um, the constrained vision. That is, men need to be constrained by right. law. and and the idea of the rule of a democracy is the unconstrained vision that 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 we we in and our, of ourselves have these potentials that shouldn't be restricted and so 
conservatives who believe in tradition, even if they don't understand it, they believe that the rules were put there to restrain us, to constrain us, um, because we don't know enough. We can't know everything that's going to happen. And so these institutions are needed because they help society. In the unconstrained vision, um, th they see the role of ow, ow, institutions. Ow. Uh, they see the role of institutions as um, uh, as as a negative force. That any problem that exists is because institutions have restricted people. That people themselves are are you know have all these potentials. So so the brilliant people, the intelligent people, the elite, they need to be able to be unconstrained. And, and so, so that's why you see that democracy is really about the unconstrained vision and republicanism has, is based upon the constrained vision that man is inherently flawed where the unconstrained is that man is inherently has all this potential and uh, um, should not be constrained. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's a pretty uh, simplification of of his premise, but it because uh, people aren't always consistent in that way. But some people operate sometimes on the constrained vision, sometimes on the unconstrained vision. But we believe, you know, as as Adventists, in a sense uh, that man needs to be constrained because we are sinful, right? But we also do have these potentials that God provides to us. Um, um, through his spirit, that is when we're connected with God, in a sense, we, we also believe in the unconstrained vision in that sense. But, but we know that man is sinful. And as far as society is concerned, uh, we need rules, we need institutions. God has set those up to hold back evil. Agreed. Now, under the form of government that we call republic, we are seeing very much that this was a rule of law, right? Yep. <clears throat> under a republic and under the form of a republic, we are very much like that of the Medes and the Persians. Mm -hmm. Yet under democracy, since the rule is by the majority, it is not a rule of law. It is very much like that of the Greeks. What, yeah. Whatever 51% of the people decide that becomes the prevailing opinion. We are again showing the progression of the empires of biblical history. At this point, it, it's interesting for me because under the form of a republic, the minority rights are inalienable. Yep. Under that of a democracy, the minority rights are overridden by the majority. So what we are looking at right now as this last election cycle is ending is we are looking at a group that fundamentally wishes the American experiment to change from the rule of law to basically mob rule. Whatever the mob wants is what the mob wants to get. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and and you know, so we know uh, Plato's Republic, uh, his book. Okay. Uh, right. So it has to do with the ideas of you know state and ethnics and all those types of things. Um, so we know that that um, the Greeks were were Democrats. I mean, they believed in democracy, right? That's right. the idea. But Plato sort of recognized that that was a problem, right? Right, and and that you needed this, uh, you needed a republic. Now, um, you know, and I'm not an expert on that that history. I haven't read a lot. I haven't read Plato's Republic. I've only read about it. Um, but, but this is this debate, debate going on basically between, you, you know, he have something like the World Economic Forum. I mean, they're definitely believe in the unconstrained vision. They want to have the, the elite rule the world, that um, the idea of individual rights is, is, is something that they don't really believe in because individual rights are going to hinder um, basically what this great, wonderful world that we could bring about, you know, so we can set aside individual rights because we know better and, and we can make the world a better place. Right. And if people just didn't, if, if we didn't have all this independent thinking and individual rights, you know, these are the things that actually hinder, right. Conservatism hinders uh, this progress of man. Right. I mean, that would be the idea of the World Economic Forum, of globalists in general, right, uh, the, the left. Um, so, so you have these extremely conflicted, and, and well, we know that the, the papacy is on that side of things, though the papacy has a different view of what they want the world to be. Uh, they still believe in a sense of an elite controlling the world. They don't believe in individual rights or freedoms. They give lip service to them when it serves their purpose, but they definitely don't believe in in liberty, in in the in the truest sense, right? That people should be free. And um, so you have the globalist and the papacy, but now you have Protestant America, which is a republic. But remember, the Protestant horn fell in the 1840s. 1844, technically, and the Republican horn falls in our history. Now, we still have not ever resolved how that comes about or what that means. I mean, we know that the United States reaches across the Gulf to clasp, 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 and of, of the papal power and uh, over the, the uh, I can't remember this and there's the other one. Um, but anyway, uh, to, to, to join with uh, spiritualism, right? And so we can definitely see that spiritualism is represented by things like the World Economic Forum, by the globalists, by the UN. Um, it's sort of the secular humanism, at least is how we've seen it um, develop under that that term, that title, though it's it's definitely uh, quite bizarre in its manifestations. But then you see the papacy is really on that side of things, but but a religious power, not a secular power. And then you have the United States that joins with these powers. It it can't possibly be truly republican in doing so. That it has to be a repudiation of the republican uh, horn, right? Of of the constitution, right? I would agree. So, so, so do Republicans have to become non-Republicans in a sense, but Republicans in name only? Or is it that the Democratic Party uh, is in control of the United States? Because I've always thought that when the Sunday law, law comes, it's through the Republican uh, control of the United States. But I, I don't know if we've ever really resolved that issue. It's something that I never really thought about until uh, January 6, 2021, or just before that, the end of 2020. 
after you know Biden won the election. I never really considered it very deeply. All right, let's let's look at one thing before we go and answer your question. Okay. I am in I am in agreement with you that in 1844 that the Protestant horn had fallen because the Protestant churches of that time had chosen not to follow God's law but chose to follow fables. Mm-hmm. I believe that the movement of that time was raised up to become the Protestant horn, but that the church, the corporate Adventist church, by 1863 had chosen to abandon its position on the Protestant horn or to to have abandoned becoming the Protestant horn. Okay, um, just on that point. So my understanding is that uh, we had this, if we look at the reform line, it goes from Protestants to, to Millerites. The first angel's message is a message to Protestants. The second angel's message is a message to the Millerites, right? Okay. Right. And um, the Protestants had this opportunity to be reformed by this reform line. Correct. And and in some ways, for in order for Christ to have returned, um, way more Protestants needed to accept this message. Right. right. So if the Protestants had accepted this message, um, I mean, there still could have been a disappointment. Right. This didn't return, but then they would have been part of this movement to warn the world they would now be Millerites, and there would be a lot more of them. And then October 22nd, 1844 would come about, and then you would have had this larger movement then being connected with the Sunday law, the Sunday law in a sense. Um, you know, however this would work, I don't know, you know, going back and saying what ifs, how this would unfold. But the Sunday would be still, there would be this conflict. The United States would be standing against uh the sunday law in a sense so we know that things would have happened differently i guess is what i'm saying if things were different (laughs) right Um, but still christ could have returned in that history and there would have been a conflict over the sabbath and sunday it just would have been different it would have been you know the protestants standing against the papal errors but of course that didn't happen now the Adventist church represents Judah. The Protestants are represented by Northern Israel. And the joining of the two sticks could have occurred in that history because we actually have these two time prophecies, the, tw- the two 2520s, that are being representing those two sticks. But because the Protestant horn fell, the joining of the two sticks has to occur in our history. Right? Right. So, so our history repeats this history, and and we have uh, these Protestants are going to join with Adventists in opposition to the papacy, to the Sunday law. Now, in our history, we know the Republican horn falls. So we would always put this at the Sunday law. You know, that's when the horn falls. But then we started moving it to the image of the beast test. It comes prior to the Sunday law. But in some ways, we look at January 6th, uh, 2021, as basically the fall of the Republican horn in that it's defeated. So, so some of our views still have to be sorted out in, right. because as we get into a greater detail, how that, came ab- how that comes about in the United States, the fall of the Republican horn, it, it starts to be more complex. There's more details involved in it. The point that I'm submitting at this at this moment is that the movement will need to be 
the Protestant horn. Well, we need to be truly Protestants. Um, Correct. I don't know if we could be the Protestant horn per se, because that's that's a particular a characteristic of the United States um, that fell. So the Protestant and the Protestant horn is it's good. Protestants are going to well, their 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 fall is going to be complete at the Sunday law. Correct. <clears throat> but the situation <clears throat> the situation that we have here is under a republic the rights of the minority are inalienable. Under a democracy, the rights of the minority are overridden by the majority. Yeah. So, standing as the Protestant horn, that that protests Rome, will become a clarion call to those true-hearted believers still within the corporate church and those that are outside the church because they will begin to see that Rome has established the vision and that we cannot truly worship God if we are unwilling to worship him in spirit and in truth in keeping with his law as it is presented. This becomes the point of the movement because we're going to see a fall of a republic. The Republican horn has been being set aside for a long time. Yeah. But the globalists took control of the United States. That is, I mean, I can see that the United States, if, if you're going to take the idea of re, re, grasping the hands of spiritualism, right? That that would be the January sixth uh, uh, siege of Washington D.C. What happened in connection with that? Agreed. Right now, the globalists want their viewpoint over every other and nothing is seen to be standing in their way because they see much as the pope does that they are in the temple of god and they believe that they are god mm -hmm. and then the idea that we think that it needs to be a republican president that brings in the sunday law i mean that's still one of the questions that that needs to be examined because I mean that's the reason why we wanted Trump to be president. I mean, not that we wanted him to, but you know what I mean. From I a do. point of view, well, here we have a Sunday law, here we have a Republican president connected with the evangelicals, though he was just courting their vote like he does with everyone else. He he wasn't, he's not really a Christian, and he's not really um, and definitely he is if he has a value system, his value system is he's a constitutionalist. He believes in the individual, right? The value of the individual. Um, and, and he believes in the rule of law. So, you know, he believes in the constrained vision to a large degree in most of how he operates, at least politically, maybe not in his personal life. Um, but he doesn't see that, that the elite needs to rule. He believes that the individual needs to have his own uh, autonomy in order to act as he sees fit because Trump believes that that's the best for everyone, right? He wouldn't want to have um, the elites control the world. I mean, that was his whole uh, his whole view of things. Why he even became president in the first place. So, but but we can see that. It doesn't have to be a Republican, at least I can see. It doesn't have to be a Republican president in order for the Republic to have fallen. It's simply that the Republic, that United States is no longer a Republic. And that's a sad thing. Yeah, and that means it would be a democracy. 
not just, you know, because it's still going to be democratic in a, in a certain sense, I guess. But it is mob rule. Right. And, and it's just that lots of the things that that we first thought about Trump, you know, that was being presented in the media that, you know, he's a populist and, and this was, you know, he was basically, um, you know, we paralleled him to people like Napoleon and so forth. Um, well, that doesn't, doesn't really make sense to me. Um, I mean, if Trump, if anything, Trump would be on, on the good side of things, not that he's a moral person, but because he believes in the Constitution. And, and so the idea to get Trump to become president so that he can bring in the Sunday law, one is it ignores everything about the lines. And if we take, you know, if we accept that July 6, 2021 was this major event, we need to be able to understand what that event was, that there is a line itself that addresses the fall of the Republican horn. Right. We haven't really defined that. So, you know, and that was the whole problem that I had with what Colin was doing is it was quite clear that we had this, this structure and, and Odilio added to it and, and then and then Colin added to it as well, chronological structure that was telling us something quite different than that Trump would be president. It was really trying to say that he's not going to be president, that he's fulfilled his role. And we need to recognize that Greece defeated um, Medo-Persia or Persia on January 6, 2021. And and so we need to understand this, this thing of the king of the north and the king of the south and what it means. But when we say that we know that the king of the north will then uh, conquer the king of the south, I don't think we could just say, well, that means Trump's going to become president again. Because there's a much bigger scale in which this is occurring. This isn't really about Trump as a person. It's about the United States. Yes as a country, right, as a republic that's falling. Trump played a part in that, but his part was to try to hold together the republic, but he loses that battle. Persia, which is about the law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be changed, that's constitutional. It, it is defeated by Greece. And so what we see with the rise of Alexander this definitely is the new age. This is the globalists. But then when we, you know, we, we start to take these lines and look at them, we know that Alexander's kingdom gets divided. So it, again, is going to illustrate what's happening presently in the United States under this um, globalist agenda. Right. So the United States now is is being dismantled. The Republic is being dismantled. Right. And so when we, we compare it with France, what you would see is, is similar to France in the sense that um, that civil war that happened in France, because that's really what it was, that, that rebellion, the, the revolution. I mean, that's what's happening in the United States now. And, and of course, the power that's doing that is, is an atheistic power, the globalists. I, I don't know if that makes sense. But, you know, we tried to put Trump in, you know, in that, that role, but Trump doesn't really serve that role. But the United States is, is repeating that history, so to speak. It's definitely repeating it. Yeah. So, and, and so this is about the country, the United States, right? This is about what happens to the United States. The players themselves are, are not the issue. I mean, they obviously have a role and it's part of the whole, the whole structure. But what's happening in the United States is the dissolution of, of republicanism. So, so... The United States, Trump is the last Republican president, and he's also really the last president of the United States, because the United States is a republic. And since the Republican horn has fallen, 
what what goes on really in that sense is under a new power right and and so we're not going to even see under this new power even though it tends to be democratic right i mean that's the the tag to it i mean we don't see democracy working in the united states right now not a true democracy because because the institutions the media and so forth are controlled uh by the state well no i would say that the media is more not so controlled by the state they are a willing participant with the state okay yeah they're working together with the state so i mean when when you're when you're talking about a media controlled by the state Pravda was a, a good example of that. Yeah, truth. Yes. <laughs> now. <laughs> so, hey. Um, yes. <laughs> ABC was owned by William Casey. Okay. He, his whole a holding company that he had uh, was the one that actually owned ABC, which uh, theoretically places them under the control of the CIA. Um, right. it is sort of, ha it had sort of happened with Google because the CIA stepped in and started giving them tons of money for development and stuff. How do you think they rose to power so quick? It wasn't just because that, um, that, uh, they had this great deal, which they did, you know, they had a good thing that was coming along, but, um, the government scene or not the government per se, but, uh, clandestine organizations, um, and this stuff has been fairly well documented throughout history of our medias. And so it actually can be controlled, uh, even, even if we don't know it yeah. and who well, is controlling it. Well, it's not controlled directly by the, the, the state. It's controlled by elements within the state. Correct. Which really are the left. Um, um, yeah, right. we can say that. So, so, you know, even if you have a Republican uh, Congress, uh, um, you know, with the Senate and the House both being Republican and a president being Republican, uh, the media is still being controlled then by the opposition, right? Yes. So, yes. so the media has an agenda. It's in alliance with certain powers within the government. And, and that makes for an unfair advantage in a democracy. Right. And the whole idea of the freedom of the press was really supposed to take away that um, that role of the press. But uh, there's reasons why the the left controls the media and the right doesn't. Um, and part of that has to do with uh, uh, the conscientiousness of people who are on the right compared to the, con the lack of conscientiousness of people on the left. So in a sense, evil always has an advantage in this world. That's right. Yeah. Because it can act and do things that, I mean, you're not going to have Republicans um, uh, voting uh, Republican when they're dead. Um, <laughs> you will have a Democrat doing that, and, uh, you know, even if they were Republicans before. <laughs> so, and, and the reason has to do with the fact that the Democrats are have no, have low conscientiousness. You know, if you test somebody who's who's on the left, they are not conscientious, and and it's just it's the, it's the nature of of why they're on the left. They're much more likely to steal, much more likely to be immoral than somebody who's a conservative. Doesn't mean that conservatives aren't immoral because sometimes people, especially in politics, I mean, the scum rises to the top. So there's lots of immoral people who, who pose as conservatives, but aren't really in, you know, in, in the true sense that they aren't really conscientious. But, but if you just test the population for conscientiousness and then you tend to test them for um, where they stand politically, the ones who are conscientious are more likely to be conservatives. 
and the ones who have low conscientiousness are more likely to be liberals. So, I mean, it's just a statistical fact. It's not, I mean, there's always exceptions, of course. But, always. Yeah. But when you t take it in, in, in into a bell curve, uh, you definitely see that there, I mean, there's an overlap there, but these are quite distinct bell curves from each other in the sense that um, people act in a certain way and believe in a certain way. Uh, they're, they're going to be, you know, conscientious. They're going to be much more conservative in their views politically. So, Okay, so you wanted to get, uh, where do we want to get here today in our half hour remaining? All right. In the, in the, in the paragraphs that we're about to read, let us pay attention as to how this interrelates with the movement today, because this is, this is where our responsibility lies. Once we have a clear understanding of how this relates to us, then we can begin placing this onto a line because it will be our granted responsibility to give a message to those that are seeking truth and are not finding truth currently from their chosen purveyors of truth. The paragraph we ended with on Thursday, the Israelites, blinded by their own sinful course of apostasy, were acting contrary to God's express commands, and he left them to reap the results of their own folly. Since 1863, the church, blinded by its own sinful course of apostasy, was acting directly contrary to God's express commands and he left them to reap the results of their own folly. Our situation here is that in abandoning Miller's rules, in abandoning the prophetic foundation of the church, and seeking man's wisdom over God's, we can see that <clears throat> this course of apostasy is now going to come home to roost. It was not God's will that Israel should have a king. It was not God's will that the church should rely upon man's wisdom rather than his. But in case they desired to be thus governed, the Lord, understanding the pride and the perversity of the human heart, had reserved to himself the right to appoint a king over them. Our Heavenly Father has reserved the right to take the work into his own hands when men choose not to do as he would have them to do. God had brought Israel out from Egypt to be a peculiar people, especially devoted to himself and unlike any other people. God brought the Advent movement out from the world to be a peculiar people especially devoted to himself. And they were to be unlike any other. Israel's great ambition to imitate the idolatrous nations around them was the result of separation from God. Does this need further explanation? No. Can we see 
in this one paragraph the steps that have been taken since 1863. Well, you know, I, I brought this up before, um, but it, it's good to bring it up again. So there was a book I, I read, and I think it was called The Seventh Day, but, but I could be mi mixing it up with another book. Anyway, it was a book written by a sociologist regarding the Adventist church and the role that he took. And uh, uh, this book is from the 70s, so. Uh, but the role, the 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 view that he took, is that the Seventh Day Adventist Church has imitated the American government, and and there are some superficial things such as, you know, where we have our our um, general conference. You know, it's in Maryland or whatever, but you know, it's really connected with Washington D.C. Right? And Technically, but. They are in Maryland. Yes, that's yeah. right. It's Maryland. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but but the thing is, they're imitating the United States. We have our own educational system. We have our own hospital system, and and you know the, the thing that I find odd too is you know we got uh, uh, we we imitate a lot of the other sort of not official institutions of the government, but things like Boy Scouts. So we have Pathfinder. And, and, you know, that the church is modeling itself after the United States in, in form, right? Um, and so this was basically the guy's uh, premise is that, uh, that, that this, is, this is this parallel sort of institution to the United States. Now, of course, he's not thinking of this prophetically, but you, we can see that how this applies prophetically. Israel's great ambition to imitate the idolatrous nations around them. Now, of course, here, this is Israel imitating these, these governments, but the church has imitated the state. Adventism has tried to, in a sense, run a parallel kingdom to the United States. Does that make sense? Right. right. Yes. So, and, and so it's copied the world. Right. The Adventist Church has continued to copy the world in how we run our churches, uh, our programs, our charities. All these different things are, are an imitation of the idolatrous nations around us. And that's the result of a separation from God. So that's their mistake, right? And that is perpetuated down the line of mistakes um, throughout the history of Christianity. Well, yeah. here's our here's our situation. The corporate church was raised up and was supposed to be a peculiar people. They were supposed to be God's shining light, as it were. Yeah. At this point, the church itself has modeled itself very much according to the programs that you find with the United States government. Now, two years ago, the government issued a decree that said, shut down the churches, right? You must socially distance. You must not gather together. Yet, what is the biblical admonition? Are we not told, forsake not the gathering together of yourselves? Yeah. Well, the state should not have come in and, and told Christians what to do. Okay, but the state did. Yeah. What and, the church, church, and the church should not have supported that. What church was extremely vocal with its members on that subject? As far as, as, as accepting what the state wanted us to do? Yes. Well, the Adventist church. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I just I put a link in there. Um, I'm just gonna share the screen so other people could see it. But this is the book I was talking about. It's called uh, Seeking a Sanctuary: Seventh Day Adventism in the American Dream. Okay. So uh, it says here it's published in 2007, but this is obviously a, a more recent publication because I read it a long time ago. So it might have been the 80s that the book was written in. But okay, so so I shared a link there for anybody right. to, to look at it. That's just thank it's you. PDF. It's just uh, um, it's going to give you uh, some of the pages of it. All right, so it's going to give me what a sample of it, I guess. Preview. The thing that that struck me also very hard about this. Not only are we imitating, are we seeing the church imitate the state when the state required the shutdown? The church, through its medical institutions, has been one of the foremost providers of abortions. Mm -hmm. I look at abortions at this point as being nothing more than the worship of Molech. Yeah, as well I. Now, we have choices to make. All of us have choices to make. We cannot afford to worship at the altar of the state. We cannot afford to worship at the altar of Molech. Anything short of our complete, total surrender to God is idolatry. Now this next paragraph covers some very severe points and many are going to find this to be a very hard saying. Pride and ambition similar to that which cursed ancient Israel exists in the church of God today. Yeah. Okay. As we note, this is written, this was published two days before the death of James White. She is saying prior to the death of one that had been like Moses for the church, that pride and ambition similar to that which cursed ancient Israel exists in the church of her time and it exists today. To me, that means that the church, in joining with the state, is under a curse. They are unwilling to be a peculiar people, distinct and separate from the world. They are unwilling to raise the Protestant horn to call people out from its worship of the state. To reach the Bible standard requires self-denial, a crucifixion of the affections and lusts. The unsanctified heart reaches out for forbidden things, but these are the very objects of desire, these, but these very objects of desire will prove now, as anciently, a source of weakness and corruption. Christ gave himself for us that he might cleanse us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. 
Those who seek the honor which comes from men are ever ready to adopt the customs and practices of the world. Is this not what we're seeing now? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they gain their position by the exercise of traits of character which should lie dormant. If only those were exalted who had gained their position by fidelity to God and to man, the standard of morality and religion among the people would be elevated. Can we scroll down a little bit, please? Okay. Staying on. I was looking at the JPEG you sent me. Yeah. I thought you'd enjoy that. Yeah, okay. The sin of which we are guilty in acting contrary to God's expressed will is as much greater than was that of ancient Israel as our light and privileges have been greater than theirs. We were discussing this uh, Sabbath afternoon at uh, my niece's house. Um, you know, just looking at, at the role that the church has taken in, well, we were dealing with lots of different things like the school systems um, and and what's being taught about evolution and, of course, LGBTQ. Um, but this is the thing, is that the church has joined with the state, and we've talked about this before, but for money, right? And... And all in the name of, of being able to do God's work, we have tied ourselves to uh, the state through these nonprofit status. But if we believed in God, we would never have had to do that. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay, go on, Dwight. The Shechemites sealed the compact with their new king by presenting him with a sum of money from the treasure, which had been dedicated to their god, Baal Bereth, the Lord of the Covenant. By accepting the gift, Abimelech covenanted at the very commencement of his reign to use his influence and authority to promote the worship of that God. Thus, he publicly pledged himself to counteract, as far as possible, the work which Gideon, his father, had done in overthrowing idolatry. Such has ever been the history of the world <clears throat> since the fall of man. God will use those who give themselves wholly to his service. And Satan not only marshals his host of evil angels and arrays them against God, he employs men to execute his plans and to defy the king of heaven. Right now, mankind believes through the media and through others, that a new world order must be established. The new world order, the Green New Deal, is nothing more than idolatrous pagan worship. It is elevating man, believing that man has the wisdom to be able to make things better. We are at a state where we must examine for ourselves where we stand. Are we truly protesting Rome? Are we truly protesting the pagan 
idolatry that is currently pervasive throughout this country. What are we worshiping? How are we worshiping? Are we still so <clears throat> infected with the positions of Parminder and Tess that we cannot give the trumpet a certain sound? Are we so weakened in our thought processes and in our worship that we are trying to worship both the idols of the world and thinking that we're worshiping God? Are we that much like Gideon's father? Where will we stand today? How will we stand today? Are we going to be prepared by God to give a specific message to this world? To blow that Protestant horn, that Protestant trumpet? To call people from their slumber? Or are we going to be <clears throat> like Abimelech, like the church, accepting the sum of money from the house of Milo, the senate of the Shechemites? This money dedicated to their God, the God of the covenant. What covenant are we looking to be part of today? I mean, Mrs. White is very clear. Such has ever been the history of the world since the fall of man. We know that our adversary is going to marshal his angels against God. They know that they are defeated. All they are trying to do now is to get as many to their side as possible. But he is also employing men to execute his plans and to defy our Heavenly Father. If you would, scroll down just a little bit, please. Okay. Thank you. Abimelech now proceeded to execute his power as suited his cruel character. <clears throat> Do you think the current lame duck Congress and the current occupants of the White House would have any problem stepping on individual rights if this was something that opposed what they see as their direction and rule? If a church stood up against abortion and stood up clearly against abortion, don't you think that the, the full force of the government would then be turned against it? With the money he had received, he hired a set of unprincipled men who were ready for any crime. They were willing to lie, steal, cheat, murder, any crime. At the head of this company, he marched to Ophrah, 
where Gideon's family still dwelt and basely murdered them all, except one brother, Jotham, who escaped. Abimelech well knew that these men were far better qualified than himself to stand at the head of the kingdom, and he felt that while they lived, his throne would not be secure. Hence, he conceived and executed this fiendish crime that he might undisturbed enjoy the coveted honor, being the first who had borne the name of king among the descendants of Jacob. Returning in triumph to Shechem, Abimelech was immediately anointed king. What does this say to us today? How can we apply this with what we're seeing currently within the movement? Well, in the movement, we wouldn't think that we're aligned with the state. You know, and that we're receiving, you know, funds from the state or anything like that. Um, like the churches. Yes. But you're asking how, what is there that parallels this? We've been discussing for the last couple of weeks that there is some kind of infection within the movement, some kind of holdover from Parminder and Tess. Right. That is, there's some premises that that people are operating on that is the same premise that um, Parminder and Tess had. And that is that was, how, to, how to get what you want, basically. How is this to be rooted out? Well... I mean, God brings us through trials and, and teaches us a dependency upon God. Um, but, you know, this movement has to come to the upper room. The disappointment that we had should have, have wrought a different work in us than it seems to have had. Um, isn't, isn't this, Dwight, the, the question you had about seeing this in the movement, how do we see this in the movement? Um, I, I'm thinking that this is more, can we, can we look at this at the point of where God actually starts taking control? Um, it's, it's not about what we do. It, it's about what we say, All right. um, and, and what we do, but it's, you know, it's, it's the way we treat our brethren, um, which is, I think. One of the one of the hardest things to probably try to get uh, um, everybody familiar with, you know, they don't even realize they're doing it. And, and th these are good people. Every one of those people that that we know are good people. It, it's just mindset. It, it's, it's it's it's. Am I explaining myself correctly there? I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? It's 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 it's, it's the mindset, and and it's something's going to click soon that yeah. is going to change the mindset and that, that that's god doing that stuff it's it's not what we are do we just need to continue to do what we're doing which is study and trying to make sense of all this stuff and as we begin to make sense of it we we publish it well I mean, and also what... yeah and also i mean this isn't just about other people i mean this is about us yes in this boat together so to speak yes but we do have a message right so bimlech reflects a message and yes. jotham also reflects a message and that message is characterized by the 70th week and we know that in our study of the 70th week that's jesus uh, well it's christ so one is we see it's christ crucified right um, that means that this is about an experience that we have, but that experience comes from an understanding of prophecy. And God has given us um, information 
that helps us look at our lines and understand their purposes. And, you know, the first day of the first month, which the week of Christ points to at, as April 5th, 2030, uh, we don't know what that means particularly other than that, that our work is still future. That, that is, there's a work that this movement has to do and Collins uh, structure and Adilio's fits in with that. But this is about a work that has to happen because of our failures. We have to we have to recognize that um, first our individual part in that what we have done, how we've been in infected by this message of Abimelech. Yes, right. and um, that we've we've attacked the the basis of prophecy the 70th week the 70 weeks but that 70th week survives and that 70th week that survives is going to put this movement on the correct course and and that 70th week isn't just about a date april 5th 2030 it is about the cross of christ about the work of salvation about righteousness by faith it's about being truly converted what that means and we haven't understood that because we're not truly converted we've had a conversion god has begun a work in us but he needs to complete that work if we are to do the work that he has given us to do which is to reflect christ's character to the world and to the yeah. church so it took it, it, it's a time thing as well i mean the the um, apostles were not apostles until after uh, Christ. They were just basically disciples, right? You know, I mean, they were his disciples, but they weren't up to they weren't up to snuff when they first came in. It was a progressive thing, and they weren't even up to snuff when the main thing event happened. Um, in fact, that's what that's what made them realize their shortcomings. So in the upper room, 10 days after Christ ascends, um, they receive the Holy Spirit. They now have the approval of God. That is, they've come to the point where now they can do the work that God asked them to do, that Christ had been preparing them to do. And the movement needs to recognize that this, this occurs as well, that the fighting that went on amongst the disciples their opinions, their ambitions, and all these different things have continued in this movement. And if it continues, this movement will never accomplish what it was designed to accomplish. So, so somehow these things, God is going to address them. We just don't know how that is. But what you're pointing out, the point is what we have to do is continue to study and to learn and to participate in the work that God is wanting to do in us individually. Yes. We don't know how this is going to unfold in the movement. No, no, we don't know how it's going to unfold. But we have an idea of the things that are in front of us right. because of our and, studies. Right. And so we know that our responsibility is to study. To be chosen yes. individually. Well, that, well the nobility will... of it. Yeah. I mean, uh, what, what was what, what? Why did he make that comment about the Marines? It wasn't that you know um, that they were any more special, but they were doing what they needed to do to prove all the things that Paul was saying to them, mm -hmm. and which is study daily. To see if all those things, because there's lots of things that you come into, you know, uh, and people say things people say, and then you have to study on what they say, you know, to see if that's, you know, to prove it out through the word of God, because, you know, to give your response after what did they say, you know, if you just go off half cock, you're not going to really give them the right answer, yeah. but so you, you have to study for your answer. Yeah. So that's you, why you're supposed to be slow to answer. Yeah, and it's not just about an answer, though. It's that, that you actually have a foundation that you've built upon. Because anybody can just accept something as true. But if they, yes. they don't really study and understand it, if they haven't applied it to their lives, they won't hold on to that for very long. But anyway, our time, true. Is, our time is up. So I, yeah, I got to go. So um, 
So we'll come back to this tomorrow and, and continue reading here about what is um, what Ellen White says. Uh, so let's let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, for all of the things that you have been doing in our lives and for you being here in this study. We know, oh Lord, that um, um, we are weak, sinful creatures, and the work that you are doing um, in changing us is a miracle that has nothing to do with us being better or smarter or anything than anyone else. The only thing that differentiates the righteous from the wicked is that the righteous are able to acknowledge the truth about themselves. Help us to acknowledge our sins, to confess them, and to forsake them, to be truly converted. We pray again for each person. We ask that you can work in our lives, and we ask that today we can reflect your character to all we come in contact. Thank you for hearing our prayer, and bring us together again is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.